So I pulled out 10 things that stood out to me from, from two hour and a half long interviews that they did with Nick. I wanted to hop on here because I wanted to talk about something new that just came out. This interview with Nick Collins and these drum demos with a company called Drumio, which is like a, a drum education. I'm not very familiar with it. I'm not a drummer, but it's like a drum education website and platform and a YouTube channel, millions of viewers. Very cool channel. I, I'm not a drummer, but I'm kind of exploring it. You know, what's interesting is I think these interviews and, and they went to Switzerland to interview Phil Collins. We have no idea what that's about or what they talked about. I mean, they talked about drumming, but uh, we don't really know the application that's coming out next year in 2023. So we don't know what that's going to be like. All of the live uh, streams that they've been doing with Nick Collins and going through some of the Genesis catalog. I think that this content is some of the best original Phil Collins and Genesis content that we've had in years. And I mean, so many really cool uh, secrets and, and details and, and inside information from Nick being the son of Phil Collins that we get about Genesis and we get about Phil and about him, his personality and their relationship, and their career. Because I was watching this and I was realizing, wow, there are so many things I'm learning for the very first time. So I pulled out 10 things that stood out to me from, from two hour and a half long interviews that they did with Nick about drumming, about drumming on the last Domino tour and on Phil's solo tour about how he, how Phil taught Nick how to play drums. So 10 things that, that that stood out to me and I want to share them with you because I don't know if you got a chance to follow along with, with Drumio on social media or to watch these videos on their YouTube channel. Um, but I pulled out 10 things that I think we need to know. But before that, I just want to say that what this showed me was a couple of things. Nick has a great appreciation for his dad, which is kind of rare. It's rare in any father-son relationship uh, is can be can be challenging. It's also rare in the celebrity world, right? A lot of celebrity children don't want anything to do with their parents. They don't follow in their footsteps. I also get the sense that Nick might take the responsibility of keeping the Genesis legacy alive uh, years, even beyond uh, after some of these, the original members pass away. And I, I, I just kind of get that sense that like he has an incredible knowledge and appreciation of the Genesis catalog and of the solo catalog as well. And now he's playing with Mike and the Mechanics. And so I just kind of get this like warm, fuzzy feeling that Nick might help take the Genesis catalog and the legacy into the next several generations. So I think that could be cool for us as fans. The other highlight for me was I learned that Phil's a really great drummer, <laughs> which is crazy obvious, but I think you don't really fully appreciate the drums that you hear until you see someone play it. And a lot of times we don't get to see Phil actually play it with cameras on the kick pedal and overhead shots like they do on, on this Drumeo thing. And there was a great clip of, of Nick playing the cinema show that just blew my mind. And he played all of Fading Lights as well. In fact, on these videos on YouTube, and I'll provide a link for them, um, tons of deep cuts. He did In That Quiet Earth. He did What Gorilla, Fading Lights. He did some popular stuff like uh, Home by the Sea, Cinema Show, In the Cage, Los Endos, Duke Sweet, Supper's Ready. Um, tons of great tracks. Tons of really great tracks. You'll Be In My Heart as well was the only solo one that I saw him play. I think maybe he also did. I think they're working on a course as well, which is really cool, like uh, an online course. And I think that's what you get with the membership. So, I mean, depending on what they release when it comes to the the interviews with Phil, uh, I might have to sign up for this like $250 <laughs> annual membership. I'm not even a drummer. Maybe I'll just learn how to play drums. But I, but yeah, just going back to like my, another takeaway was just the idea of how good of a drummer Phil is and getting to see it and go, oh, wow, actually that, you know, the Los Endos beat how fast it is. And it's like, oh, that seems like a very, very difficult groove. You kind of lose the appreciation for it when you just hear it on record. And just these videos really highlight the the beauty of, of the drumming in Genesis. So I just listed out, these are just in random order. I listed out 10 things that I thought was really cool from this video that I think you should know. Number one is that Los Endos was in the running for the last Domino tour. In the running means that because that the rehearsals were delayed, that they had multiple stages of rehearsals. I think what, that, what I was understood was that Nick was preparing at home before going to rehearsals and there was a bunch of songs he had to prepare for. And some of those songs include Los Endos. And, and I don't think it was ever rehearsed with the band, but it was interesting that that was a song that was being discussed. Number two is that the way his dad taught him drums, according to Nick, was by teaching him just little secrets and just saying, here's one basic tip, just stick with that. And then <clears throat> instead of, you know, being like a proper drum teacher, it was just like, basically like top 10 tips kind of thing over, over the years, which I thought that's a really good way to learn. It's like, you know what, just keep this in the back of your mind 
you do your thing, you learn at your own pace, but just remember these little secrets, these little tips. So that was cool. Number three, and this is funny, he likes Chester's version of In the Cage better than he likes his dad's version of In the Cage, the drumming on the In the Cage. So they did a lot of these drumming versions from The Way We Walk and from the 2007 tour. So that's that's pretty cool. Number four, Supper's Ready was also in the running to be placed in the set. So that was a song that he had to prepare coming into rehearsals. And so that's something that they considered to play, which would have been huge for a lot of people. I'm not a huge Supper's Ready fan, but um, that would have been a big deal for a lot of people because I don't think they've done that in since you know i don't from the 80s onward i don't think they've done that song number five was the lyrics uh the the meanings of the lyrics of fading lights which is really cool so i know we've talked about this so much a lot of fans have talked about how fading lights was the last song on we can't dance which is the last genesis record that phil sang on and it has these like closing chapters uh, the lyrics are sounds like it's the end of an era. And so he asked, I mean, a, a lot of us just think, is that ironic? It, did Tony, who wrote the lyrics, did he know that this would be Phil's last album? Did he know that this would be their last collective album? Did he know that that would work so well on the, on the, the final tours? And so Nick, well on tour on The Last Domino, asked Tony if he wrote those lyrics on pot, uh, on purpose. And Tony said, yes. He said that actually uh, he had an idea and he was partly thinking uh, about the band and the end of the era because he thought that if Phil didn't leave after Invisible Touch, that he would definitely leave after We Can't Dance. And he was right. Number six uh, is, this was really interesting that he said that Tarzan, Phil has said that Tarzan is his proudest work. That's something he's most proud of. And I think that that's rightfully so because not only did it win an Oscar, it did well when it comes to Disney soundtracks. And and of course, I think there was, you know, You'll Be In My Heart did really well on the charts, but not even just that aside, but the fact that it was like another moment where Phil could reinvent himself or Phil be, could become known for something new. And that's one of the things I love about Phil is that Phil could be known just alone by by playing on the lamp. He could be known just for being on Selling England. He could be known just for releasing one of the most iconic 80s albums, whether that's Invisible Touch or that's No Jacket Required. He could be known for having the best-selling British album uh, of the year with, with But Seriously. So there's all these like kind of moments in his career that would be enough to make any one of us massively successful. And he has all these different moments. And for Tarzan is another one of these moments where a lot of younger people know him from Tarzan. So it was interesting to, to hear him say, or, or to, that Nick had heard him say that Tarzan was his proudest work. Very cool. Number seven is how bad, how hard the Simmons drums are to play. And, and you know, I've never touched a pair. I've never seen a pair. <laughs> A set, but Nick said that when you look at it, you would think that it's like a practice pad, where like the the it'll absorb a little bit of the 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 stick, the impact of the stick, and send it back to you a little bit. But the opposite is true; it's actually like a super hard plastic, according to the the guys in the video. So that was really interesting too. Uh, and they talked about how bad it would be to play those Simmons drums, which he did on the um, on the Invisible Touch tour, and to play those night after night could be really bad on your wrists because it's like taking a hard stick and whacking a table. And that could do some damage on your wrist. Number eight is actually in line with that. And they talked about how, how bad the drum posture was for Phil and how he had his seat really high. And then all of his drums were, were often angled, almost perpendicular with the ground. And which means that you're hunching over and you're getting your sticks in to hit them straight on. And so it kind of speaks to like maybe this, you know, Phil had gotten used to a certain way of playing before we had physiotherapists, before we had ergonomics, <laughs> before we knew that this might not be a sustainable way. Uh, and he maybe got used to playing it that way and and then couldn't change or nobody really told him to change. And it didn't seem to be a problem, but it obviously has caught up with him in his health many years later. So really interesting about you know how angled his snare is. And when I was a kid, I was playing drums as a kid, just emulating Phil Collins. <laughs> And I would set up my drums to look like Phil Collins. I would take the the heads off the back <laughs> for it just so that they looked like Phil's drums. And I would even actually get clear skins and then draw that black circle in the middle because I didn't have skins that had that black circle. But anyway, but I would always angle things up like a wall of drums because that's the way that Phil did it. And so it's interesting that his bad posture contributed to, to some of the problems that he's having now. Number nine is that Supper's Ready, the drumming on Supper's Ready is improvised, which I mean, I don't 
don't know if that's, I don't, that was new to me. I don't know if that's new to other people, if that's been written about before, um, but it makes it difficult. I guess it, it makes it difficult um, for anyone to try to learn that part because he's doing a lot of things different that there isn't necessarily a consistency to it. Now, Phil has talked in the past about recording drums uh, in the early Genesis days and how you would do a couple passes. Um, and then finally you would get one that you liked and they would have to keep the drums. And then the other guys could overdub on top of the rhythm section. Nowadays you can overdub everything on in Pro Tools, but back then you would stick the the, the rhythm section to tape, and then you could overdub on top of that. Um, and so other people had the opportunity to redo their parts, but um, they always had to pick a one of Phil's that that he maybe wasn't crazy about. He always said that second or third take was his best. And so then in the fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth take, he maybe wasn't happy with it. And so we know that there's a kind of an element of, of improvisation and there's a uniqueness to each take. And so that was kind of interesting to me that Supper's Ready was completely improvised, um, and kind of piece together and and which makes it hard to duplicate. And finally, number 10, uh, interesting factoid from this show was uh, that Phil doesn't normally listen to music, which is kind of interesting. He said that, you know, he said he would never listen to his own music. That's why he hadn't heard some of this early Genesis stuff in, in years and years, let alone listening to his own music. He actually just doesn't really listen to music, which is kind of interesting. I've heard that about a lot of successful musicians um, is that they don't consume music. Although Phil's always been a music fan. So to me, that does surprise me a little bit but that's also an age thing as i get older i pretty much only listen to the records that i know i like i'm really not open to trying new things i kind of just stick to the same uh records and then you end up making a youtube channel about the records that you're only listening to for the rest of your life. So that was kind of interesting. If you haven't yet, you got to check out this series with Drumeo. I don't know what they're going to do with the interviews from Phil. We haven't seen any of that footage, but it excites me because it's great to see Phil coming out of retirement and being interviewed and talking about drums. We haven't, you know, apparently there's hundreds of hours of footage or dozens or whatever uh, hours of footage from, from of Phil talking about drumming. So hopefully we get to see it all. We know that Nick has put together some sort of course where he teaches 30 or 40 Genesis and Phil Collins songs on drums. And so I think for a lot of our viewers who are Genesis and Phil Collins fans, maybe even if you're not a drummer, uh, some of this stuff will be really interesting. So I might have to buy a membership to this thing to check it out. Um, but it's very cool. So check out all the stuff that Drumio has been doing with Nick. Uh, and Nick seems like such a great dude. I mean, you never got that uh, an otherwise impression. And it's so great to have him on all these tours. Uh, it was a real pleasure to get to see his personality and his love for his dad and, and for Genesis. 